Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, network security in, uh, on the third platform. So just a quick show of hands, who here is actually familiar with the third platform or the term the third platform? Okay, so a small group of fans at best. Um, so we should probably start with a little bit of a definition of that. Andy mentioned it um, briefly. Um, but what it is, the third platform is a term coined by IDC, who are a set of industry analysts. So they um, operate um, pretty heavily within the, um, the network infrastructure and actually um, uh, IT infrastructure space in general. Um, so it, it's really, if you go back, first platform was mainframe. Uh, second platform was client-server environment, but since then we've moved along, we've done a lot of virtualization, we started moving towards cloud and things like that. Um, so really what makes up the third, pla the third platform is that it's a collection of technologies that are really driving uh, a new information age. Um, and actually a lot of the terms when you look at them are very relevant, the things you hear a lot about. So whether the term resonates or not, certainly the technologies that sit within the third platform should resonate. Um, the four key pillars are um, mobile, social, uh, big data and cloud. Um, and actually, if you kind of look around some of the things that are kind of changing our world today as consumers and also as businesses, I think a great example is here on my wrist is a device called the Fitbit, which probably more of you are familiar with. Um, this is mobile in the sense that, in a very physical sense, it goes everywhere that I go, um, but it's also a little application that sits on my phone. Um, it's, uh, it's cloud um, in that it runs a SaaS application, uh, software as a service that sits in the cloud. I don't have an application that I run on a device at home other than, other than my phone. Uh, it's big data in that it collects data about me. It collects data about how far I walk, how much I sleep, what my heart rate is, etc., etc. And it, analy it, it analyzes that data as well and tells me that I've got something like a 2% risk of a heart attack in the next 10 years, um, which is good to know, but it's still sort of 2%. Um, uh, then the final bit, of course, is it's social. Um, so it's social in that I can invite my friends to a weekly challenge where we say, um, you know, who, the, the one who takes the most steps in that week wins the badge, etc. But it's also a social platform. So one small piece of technology on my wrist goes right across these. Um, <clears throat> it also has uh, big applications uh, across business. Um, uh, and in fact, by 2019, you're looking at uh, some of the numbers coming from IDC themselves. Uh, you take the top 2,000 businesses in the world, they're looking at 50% of those are going to be differentiating themselves based on the third platform technologies that they use. Um, a good example here is you take a sports manufacturer. Um, a lot of the innovation going in there today could be sports kit um, that elite athletes are wearing that's feeding back biometrics and anal um, analytics about um, everything from their kind of their breathing, their physiology, et cetera, et cetera. And this is going to make its way out into consumer world. So you've got people who previously made trainers who are now going to be different, differentiating themselves on technology. Um, and there's many, many examples of that that uh, you know, I don't think we need to go into today. There's um, also six technology innovators. So apologies, I've got a little bit of a cold if I kind of pause every now and then. Um, of those six technology innovators, uh, there's a number of them that I'm really not qualified to talk about. So I'm just going to brush over them quickly. But you should all recognize that they are actually things that are happening today. Things like robotics, AI, virtual reality. Um, and also uh, natural interfaces. Two that will come up in the presentation, um, uh, next generation network security, which is something that you know, I do have something to say on, and um, IoT, Internet of Things. Um, so we'll, we'll touch on those as we go. <clears throat> so that's really a definition of what the third platform is. And again, as I said, even if the, the term is out there and it's common, but it's not completely pervasive, um, but even if it doesn't make it as a term, the technologies I think you'll recognize are things that are driving the next set of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the next five, ten years in, in technology and the way our businesses work. Um, so what are some of the security implications of the third platform? So the first one is very, very simple. Um, you know, if you look at some of the numbers across the bottom, I'm not going to go into them. You know, we all hear, hear about Internet of Things and how many devices we're likely to have by 2020. Is it kind of, you know, 
three times the number of people on the planet is at 20 million, sorry, 20 billion connected IoT devices. Whatever it is, it's a big number. We can all see the movement towards the cloud. That's gathering adoption year on year. Um, so, you know, again, by 2020, you're looking at nearly 70% of workloads being public cloud workloads. So this stuff is happening. Some of the security implications of that are, firstly, very simply, the attack surface is wider. Um, so there are more things that you can exploit now than there were previously. Um, that's very, very obvious in IoT. Um, you know, 20 billion connected devices, many of them not secured very well, are out there. Um, and we've already seen a lot of exploits on the back of that. Um, cloud service providers are also interesting. One of the issues here is that where you've got a service provider or a cloud service provider and somebody attacks them, then the impact is greater because they have many, many customers. So um, somebody targets them, somebody takes them out, then you're impacting a lot of businesses in, um, in one go. Um, uh, so the attack service is wider, but then what does that lead to? Um, and you kind of look at the types of, um, uh, of what happens after the exploits happen. Um, so IoT in particular is used to create something called the botnet. And the botnet is lots of connected devices around the world, you know, potentially billions of them, um, that are infected and are used to attack other systems without you even knowing it. Now, we've got a, I've got a slide on something called distributed denial of service, and we'll, we'll talk about um, IoT in, a, uh, in that context a little bit more in a moment. Um, and um, also, if you kind of think about what some of these devices are and what some of the consequences are, um, you kind of fast forward if you've got heart rate monitors, driverless cars, things like that that are all smart connected, and you breach these, what are the potential consequences um, of breaching some of these devices? We've already seen breaches with baby monitors, and I don't want to get sort of too creepy, but it is very creepy. Um, and it's, um, yeah, but it's the kind of things that we, we need to consider. Um, so like I said, I'm going to come back to the IoT in particular and DDoS thing in a second. But um, another security impact of the third platform, and um, uh, so I don't, sorry, Eamon, the security basics, you know, I think you're absolutely right. We, you know, things like firewall, perimeter firewalls are still very important. Unfortunately, it's, it is being eroded, the security perimeter. Um, I see it as essentially a front door. Um, a front door is going to stop somebody walking in off the street and stealing your you know, Star Wars collection, whatever it is. Um, uh, what it's not going to do is stop a, um, a motivated but unsophisticated burglar with a sledgehammer smashing down your door and walking in. Um, so if you have not, no other protection, um, then there are uh, pretty easy ways to get into a house. So that's how I see a, a perimeter firewall at the moment. Um, uh, also, when you look at um, the way people work these days, I occasionally work from, you may have heard of, um, may or may not have heard of places like um, uh, Club Workspace or WeWork, uh, what they are, small little incubators, the places where people go to hot desks, the public, use the Wi-Fi and you, you access your, you know, either your private network or you work as a freelancer. Um, but uh, they're, you know, they're, they're places that just give you internet access. Um, you've got people in big corporate environments who are working from home on tablets, on phones, on laptops, um, and again, working from other, um, anywhere in the world. It's almost the, you know, I, I've seen some organizations whose disaster recovery plan is go to Starbucks um, and get Wi-Fi and work from Starbucks. You know, so this is the kind of world that we, that we operate in now. That means that you've increasingly got a large number of people outside the perimeter accessing key services that sit inside the perimeter. And then the other way around, we've also got a lot of people inside the perimeter who are accessing core business services that used to live inside the environment, inside the four walls of the firewall, um, now live in the cloud world. So they're increasingly going outbound for their critical service. So a lot of that means that the firewalls as we know them need to be there to stop the um, curious person walking in off the street, but aren't going to be enough to stop the sophisticated attacker. Um, uh, one of the other things that's actually... <coughs> really, really key here as well, is if you look at the statistics for encrypted traffic over the internet, um, these days you've got 50% of internet traffic is now encrypted. If you take Google services, they're up to something like, some, I think it's 73, 77, something like that, but it's in the 70s. Um, uh, so 
an enormous amount of traffic is encrypted. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't want to get too technical, but just a tiny, tiny little bit. Um, on a firewall, you have to punch holes through the firewall to allow traffic. If you're allowing um, encrypted traffic through, then you have to allow uh, a, a port protocol combination. And when you do, that means that all your encrypted HTTPS traffic goes through. You have no visibility of what sits in there. So you have to punch this hole in your firewall or nothing works. Um, and when you do, all the traffic comes in without you seeing what's in it. That means that it could contain, contain malware um, and uh, other bits and pieces that you don't want to see. So um, your perimeter firewall is increasingly going to lose visibility of what is actually going through. Um, Sorry, the final thing, and this is more on the, the data center side where you're building environments. If you're building cloud environments, you're building public, public or private cloud environments. Um, uh, one of the things that's increasingly happening is containers, microservices, um, uh, are the new virtualization. They're sort of ways of building your, your software and your infrastructure that are, um, uh, that are lightweight. Um, you've got things like software-defined networking and network functions virtualization. What all this is doing is it's moving your security policy very close to your servers where you run the infrastructure. And that means that your policy is sitting right close to the resources that you're trying to protect, which again makes your perimeter firewall a little bit less relevant. Um, but not, don't go ripping out your firewalls just yet. Um, but maybe don't spend as much money on them um, because you know, ultimately they, they do a very simple thing. They filter packets. But these days it's very easy to spend huge amounts of money on perimeter firewalls. And the, they're prov increasingly providing uh, less value. Um, so I mentioned uh, distributed de denial of service. So I want to call this one out specifically because I think, it's, um, I, I think it's pretty important. On the next slide, I've got some s statistics just to back this up, but I'll, you know, I'll come to that in a moment. So what happens with distributed denial of service? Take the example that I gave earlier. Um, uh, you've got IoT devices. IoT devices become infected. You may never know as a consumer of your IP camera or your baby monitor or your um, home broadband router, your CCTV system, whatever it is, that it's infected. Um, uh, so somebody will take control of that. Um, uh, for a fee, will choose a, a resource that they want to attack, and then um, uh, hundreds of thousands of these devices will all send very small amounts of traffic towards a target. And that very small amounts of tra traffic all aggregates into a very large amount of traffic hitting the, hitting the destination. Um, so uh, that is something, uh, so you know, IoT in particular is being exploited for this. One great example, October last year, um, uh, one of the largest volumetric attacks we've ever seen um, was on a service called Dyn. Um, Dyn run DNS services, which maps URLs like bbc.co.uk um, to an IP address. Um, uh, so, and it runs that service for organizations like Twitter, GitHub, um, uh, Netflix, etc. some of the ones I've got listed on the board behind me, um, which means that if they're offline, these organizations are offline, nobody can reach them. Um, so they got hit with, although it's unverified, but this is actually from the Dyn blog, they believe it was up to something like 1.2 terabits of um, traffic. So that, um, that's per second, um, uh, which means that their systems just can't cope with that. Unless you're an internet service provider, um, you don't have the ability to handle a tr an attack like that within your own infrastructure. There is no firewall, there is no security device. If you th think about it as an example, you know, some of you in the room might have you know, 10, 20 gig internet pipes at the edge of your network. If somebody's sending 1.2 terabits per second at you, there is nothing you can do. The, the problem has already happened before it reaches you. So that has to be dealt with in the core of the internet by the, um, the tier one carriers and service providers um, or organizations who tap in at that level and have huge amounts of bandwidth and you can, you can redirect to them. Um, but it's increasingly becoming, um, increasingly becoming a problem. Um, <clears throat> so I went looking for some statistics to back up what I um, intuitively thought was the case. Um, and one of the areas that I struggled was to find the number of service providers who've seen DDoS attacks. Um, and after looking and looking and looking, I realized that there was no article that was going to tell me the number of service providers who've been hit by DDoS attacks, because actually they've all been hit by DDoS attacks. So the numbers that I did find are that 53% of them have seen um, uh, over 50 attacks per month. 
Um, they also see them combined with application layer attacks. So the DDoS is, I'm just going to throw a lot of traffic at you, more than you can cope with. The application layer attack is, um, I'm, I'm going to go through the firewall on the port that you've already opened, and I'm going to look for exploits in your application, things that you haven't coded properly. And I'm going to um, you now if they run them both together at the same time, uh, then you're focusing on your DDoS attack and your whole world has ended because of this. And at the same time, somebody's got a sneaky little connection in to do something a little bit more malicious while you're focusing over here. Um, so something to watch out for. Um, and that you know, leads to the uh, multi-vector attacks as well. The scariest number here is the bottom one. Um, so you think we're really starting to accelerate IoT now. More and more conversations that we have as a network provider are based around um, IoT. We're talking to um, you know, um, factories, airports, people like that, around how IoT is going to transform their businesses. Um, so it's really starting to scale up. As it's scaling up between uh, 2015 and 2016, the number of distributed denial of service attacks over 100 gigabits per second increased from um, something like, well, I've got the exact number there, yeah, um, 223 to 500 and something. So these statistics are from a company called Arbor, um, who uh, basically monitor the internet. Um, so they, they do a lot of net flow monitoring on the internet. So they gather global statistics um, on a worldwide basis. I think we're probably going to send around the slides and there's sort of links to all the notes and articles to, to back this up. But to me, that number is scary because that's 2016. So 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, um, and you get to 50, million, sorry, 50 billion connected IoT devices. What's that number going to look like? But... So that's all the bad stuff. Now, um, I've been sort of in um, one way or another sort of networking and sort of security for nearly 20 years now. And um, at the first device I worked on was a, was a firewall. And since then, we've had um, IP voice, we've had video conferencing, we've had SDN, we've had virtualization and cloud. The one thing that there has always been, that's always been the hot topic, is security. And one of the reasons why is security is effectively an arms race. So we come up with something good to protect the network, and the attackers come up with something better to beat it, and then we come up with something to beat them, and the whole thing goes on. So I'm pretty sure that 10 years' time, we'll be giving this presentation. The content will be different, but it will still be an arms race, and it will always be a hot topic. Um, so we focused on the bad stuff, and that little introduction there is to say that obviously there's things that we can do on the other side. And, uh, and the third platform actually gives us some tools uh, that we haven't had before to start fighting these, uh, these attacks. So um, uh, SIEM tools, for anyone unfamiliar familiar with them, they take um, security information and events from lots of different security devices, feed it all into one place, crunch it all up, do some analysis and say, you're cool, nothing's going on, or raise a big red flag, you've got a big problem and something's happening right now. So at the, you know, the, the most basic, that's what they do. Um, um, big data and a lot of the analytics and a lot of the third platform technologies are allowing SIEM vendors to now integrate behavioral analysis. Um, and I'm not going to get into machine learning and cognitive because, again, like I said, I'm not really qualified to talk about that. But a lot of the big data and the analysis ties into these technologies and what it's enabling them to do. So that gives us greater intelligence around um, the, the data that we're collecting. This is a quick quote from um, Gartner um, on you know, where they see it. Um, <clears throat> some, uh, just to expand on the information or the security analytics piece, um, obviously um, the, other thing, the flip side of having IoT is we've now got more devices that we can collect information on. So we've got greater intelligence, and if we use that better, we've got ba better situational awareness than we, than we ever have before. Um, uh, you've um, obviously then also got public and private cloud environments, uh, which have kind of built to scale with modern, um, you know, modern virtualization and software-defined defined technologies are going to allow you to crunch a lot more data than you previously could. So that's a, another weapon in the arsenal. Um, Something that's been building up for a while, and there's a number of these. I've just picked out the ones I know. Um, global security intelligence, um, things like Cisco, Talos, and um, uh, you know, Arbor run another one um, in conjunction with something called Digital Attack Map. If you Google these, you'll find them. They've got sort of big 
um, maps of the world and um, you know ongoing attacks. Digital attack map is particularly interesting. On any day, if you go in there, you'll usually see some sort of volumetric um, DDoS attack going from um, uh, you know going from somewhere far east to somewhere in the in the Western world, uh, and and that, that's um, you know and it'll tell you um, how big the the attack is, uh, et, et, et cetera. So. Um, uh, endpoint security. So this again is um, uh, you know so, something that we don't do, and, um, and and I'm not an expert in, but I know it's it's extremely important and is part of some of the stuff Eamon was um, speaking about earlier. Um, and this is really is kind of driven out of necessity because we can't really see what's going on at the perimeter anymore. You have to be tuned in to what's actually happening at the at the endpoint. So. I've managed to get to slide eight without mentioning WannaCry um, and the incident from last week. Um, but you know, effectively, there's a number of things. So a lot of that ransomware, um, uh, malware, um, endpoint security solutions are really, really key. Um, there's a lot of good ones on the market. Um, and you know, you've got sort of insider threat things as well. Even sort of local companies like Zone Fox are, are, are playing um, in this market, so um, uh, particularly in the insider threat area. Um, security automation. So we at Hutchinson Networks recently sort of built a public cloud. As part of that, we've learned a huge amount about infrastructure and security automation. So we automate everything. Um, you know, we, we've um, pretty much every network and security appliance out there these days will have some sort of API that you can hook into um, to, to automate your configuration. Some of the pushback that I get is we're quite small. We don't really need to automate because speed of delivery isn't much of an issue for us. Because in a lot of cases, that's what it's about. It's about, I want to stand up a new service. I want to be able to do it in a couple of minutes rather than sort of three months how it, um, as fast as it used to take. But the bit that people miss around automation is if you're, um, you get a really good system admin, um, he's building a Windows server, um, and he has a template to do it from, and he hardens it, which means that he ties it down so it's secure. Um, and he does one of these every month. Um, so he goes through 11 months of the year, and everything's great. Um, when he's you know, building a new server in December, he's having a bad day. Um, you know, he's you know being ill and off work, and he's rushing. He's got stuff going on at home, and he makes a mistake on the twelfth one and doesn't build it quite to standard. Um, now you've got a vulnerability that protect, potentially impacts everything else. And that's somebody who does their job well, but like we all do, has a bad day. If you're automating this. You do it once, you get it right, and then you just replicate it out from your automation. So they're all exactly the same. And once you've nailed your security, then you've nailed it for everything else. Um, final bit on this, um, encryption. We've already mentioned sort of some of the stats, um, so I won't go into that. And again, um, you know, I think that may, there's definitely people here in Napier who know a lot more about encryption than I do. Um, uh, but where we see it um, is, uh, is, is things like encryption, um, encryption offload. So you know, where we run virtual network functions, um, uh, we, we look to, to offload that, that encryption. Um, uh, so typically, this is something that can be very expensive because you need. Previously, you would have needed specific hardware to really offload um, encryption at, at, at high rates. These days, Intel are building chips with instructions for it. So um, the excuse of it's expensive to offload encryption, so I'm only going to do my core stuff, um, doesn't really stack up anymore. We're getting to a world where you should be able to encrypt almost anything um, and uh, use a lot of the technology that's out there to do it. <coughs> A um, uh, few th messages that I want to leave you at. I've taken either end of the scale, public and private cloud. And just a few things. These lists aren't exhaustive by any means. Um, so there are many things that you should be doing. Um, but I just want to talk about if you're, and, and obviously they're either end of the spectrum. Most people are going to be somewhere in between, whether it's public cloud or private cloud. Um, when you're talking about public cloud, um, uh, you know, in, in both cases, you firstly need to be looking at your security policy and ensuring they include some of the new things, the mobile, the social, and the BYOD, et cetera. Um, uh, but if you're public cloud in particular, you need to be looking at things like third party and vendor management. Um, so you need to think about um, uh, how you're going to deal with the people who have your data and have your, have your applications. Um, so third-party review, SOC 2 reports, all that sort of stuff is going to become important. And a lot of people in internal IT, their focus will start, will become dealing with the people who provide the services, um, provide the services for them. Um, then there's some basics, endpoint security, outbound email filtering, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> 
and then a few bits for people who are building their own public cloud um, or their own um, infrastructure at the moment. Um, uh, so you know, um, software-defined technologies allow you to bring the security policy closer to the edge um, closer to the server and to whether your services are, um, are, are running. Um, obviously, SSL termination is something to think about. Um, encrypting almost everything you can and having an infrastructure that will allow you to do that um, efficiently. Um, Provider-based DDoS. Again, some products will market themselves as being DDoS mitigation. Um, but if you come back to the example of you've got... 10 gig internet pipe and somebody's throwing 1.2 terabytes at you, then what they're doing is going to be irrelevant. So provider base means that you're talking to your internet service provider or somebody about the services they can offer. And again, automation orchestration. That orchestration or that automation piece means that you're always deploying um, exactly as you, um, as, as, as you want. Um, last slide, just a little bit about Hutchinson Network, some of the things that we do. We focus on um, sort of firewall, so pr primarily network security. So we work with people like Cisco and F5 around firewalls. We do application, um, uh, web application firewalls, which allow you to look within um, the, the packet of what's going on for application layer exploits. Um, they also provide a DDoS service. Cisco Umbrella is an interesting product that's based on something called Secure DNS. So again, back to that DNS piece, which matches the URL to the IP address. You send your DNS request to them, um, and then they validate that DNS request. So if you've got a user accessing gaming or porn, or um, you've got some sort of command and control and something that shouldn't be happening, when that DNS request happens, that's going to be rejected by um, by, by, the, by the secure DNS system, in this case, Cisco Umbrella. And the final one I want to call out is something that we're just investigating and speaking to Cisco about at the moment, is a platform called Tetration. And this really is a sort of a, a third platform technology. Um, they've basically built a big data engine for network application flows um, that will um, process an incredible amount of data in, a, in an extremely short um, uh, space of time. So we're talking about a million events per second from your server and network infrastructure that's, um, uh, that will search billions of flows um, in two to three seconds. Um, so it really does take um, security analytics to another level. And on the back of that, you can use it to automatically program your security devices. So it will, um, uh, it will feed directly into a, a number of devices. It will program Windows firewalls and IP tables um, um, or you know, Cisco ACI, or will export configuration in a JSON format for you to, um, uh, to impose. So um, these are the kind of things that we do in those areas, and that's me. Um, thank you very much.